What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Canes Insight Daily Podcast, powered by Anishar and Levine Accident Attorneys. A lot of attorney talk on today's podcast because Jaden Rashada, former Miami Hurricanes commit, former Gator signee, current University of Georgia quarterback, has sued a ton of folks affiliated with the Florida Gators, including Billy Napier, the head coach. Some nasty allegations leveled at the Florida Gators, their their NIL program, their boosters. Uh, Just a lot of stuff to get into with that, and we will break it all down. Also have a great, great interview with Miami offense alignment, Samson Okalola on behalf of Kane's Connection. Really enjoyed that talk. You guys will as well. First, a word from our friends at Anajar and Levine Accident Attorneys. If you or someone you care about has been injured in an accident, you may be entitled to significant compensation. Dial 1-800-747-FREE, 1-800-747-3733, and take back control of your life with Anajar and Levine. All right, Pete, pull up the tweet here because there's a tweet that's set the big three in college football in general on fire, uh, announcing that Jaden Rashada had indeed filed a lawsuit related to his recruitment by the Florida Gators. The suit was filed in the Northern District of Florida as a federal court, Pensacola Division. And this is just the complaint. I want to keep this in mind with this disclaimer. When I talk about things that are alleged, these are taken as true, but they're just allegations at this point. This is the first document that is really filed from the plaintiff, the party suing everybody, saying what they think happened, what they allege happened. Next step is going to be a response from the defendants. It could either be an answer, you know, admitting or denying portions of that complaint, or a motion to dismiss the complaint as legally insufficient on its face. My gut reading it, we'll get into the details. I don't know if this is something that's going to be dismissed quickly. And if it is dismissed, it would probably be for some technical issue and, and amended. I don't see this thing going away at the dismissal stage. This could be a long haul. Next step after the answer or motion to dismiss will likely be discovery, which is, you know, those of you who are non lawyers, you may have seen this, you know, on TV. These are the depositions, these are the document requests, subpoenas, things of that nature. Uh, really nasty part of litigation in certain cases, and often a reason why cases get settled early because you want to avoid that process. That's getting ahead of ourselves. I just want to let everybody know where we are in this process. All right. So, first thing, and uh, Pete, pull up the tweet by uh, by our friend Kevin Clark. Chain Rashad is a quarterback for Georgia. So before he filed suit, the suit was authorized by Kirby Smart, his head coach. It's very interesting considering that Billy Napier is one of the defendants in this lawsuit. More defendants in the lawsuit. Uh, Hugh Hathcock, who is probably the biggest Gator donor to athletics, eight-figure donor, names on the building. Billy Napier, of course, the head coach of the Florida Gators for now. Uh, Marcus Castro Walker, the former director of player engagement and NIL for University of Florida, so University of Florida employee. And then Velocity Automotive Solutions LLC, which is the company, the legitimate company uh, of Hugh Hathcock. So those are the defendants. And I, I thought it made sense to sort of walk through a chronology of what's alleged because that's really how I understand these cases and it helps kind of put the put the story together. And again, these are allegations, but the The chronology and the timing of these things really paints an ugly, ugly picture if taken as true. Some interesting things to note. There's no breach of contract claim in this suit. There is no uh, claims against the Gator Collective, which actually signed Rashada to his initial contract. So it's a different kind of suit. It reads like a contract uh, claim in many respects, but it's really not. It's more about fraud, fraudulent inducement, negligent misrepresentation, interfering with other contracts, tortious interference with the contract, which is where Miami comes into play in this whole thing. We'll walk through that and, and a couple other claims, but those are just some things off the top that caught my attention. No breach of contract, no naming of the Gator Collective itself, and of course, no naming of the University of Florida itself, although Billy Napier a current employee of the university is named. All right, let's walk through the chronology. Again, these are the allegations. Early June 2002, Hugh Hathcock on a visit, Rashad is visiting University of Florida. Hugh Hathcock, their top donor, said that he could do whatever needed to be done to land him with the Gators. This would be an NCAA uh, NCAA violation, if true, because of the booster player contact. Uh, Hathcock also suggested that he could get Employment for Jaden Rashad's father, Harlan, in the security industry. Again, if true, a violation. June 26, 2022, I remember this, I was on the beach. Uh, Jaden Rashad commits 
to Miami. It's alleged that he had a $9.5 million NIL deal with Life Wallet. That's John Ruiz's entity. John Ruiz, of course, remember at this time, was the most prominent uh, face of Miami's NIL program. Uh, after Rashad committed to Miami, Hugh Hathcock, again, the Florida booster, offered Jaden approximately $11 million in a UF-affiliated NIL deal. It would have run through Hathcock's Velocity Automotive Company, so his actual company, and also his own NIL co collective, the Gator Guard. There's two NIL collectives involved here, so it might get confusing, but when you think Hathcock, the individual, his collective was the Gator Guard. October 30th, 2022. So Rashad has been uh, committed to Miami for several months now. John Ruiz has made a lot of tweets to the Gators, infuriating them about their losses on the recruiting trail. Very sensitive subject. Gators are not taking those losses kindly in recruiting, also losing on the field. A lot of unrest developing. October 20th, 30th, 2022. Florida's director of NIL and player engagement, uh, Marcus Castro Walker, who we talked about Marcus Castro Walker being an official employee. He reached out to Rashad's agents and he sent a text message basically saying, we need to lock down Jaden. We want him to flip this week. Negotiations took place, ultimately landing at the number of $13.85 million for Jaden Rashad, an unbelievable number. This would include a $500,000 signing bonus. Now, here's the interesting part. This deal would run through Hathcock's company, which is a Velocity Automotive for part of this as well as his 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 collective the uh, the the gator guard so hathcock is really the man allegedly behind this initial 13.85 million dollar deal november 9th 2022 uh the agents for the rashadas sent them a message saying that we have a contract with velocity again this is the hathcock entity being ironed out now hugh the booster wanted to discuss again in the AM should just be plugging in at that point and be done with collective side is done with just need to finish this part. So I guess they're trying to work out the details of the company component of this $13.85 million deal. This point you had a lot of action and this is why the timing to me is so interesting. You had a half cock tweet, which will Peter's pulling up basically, you know, telling Gators is good news on the way, sit tight, you know, really putting on a show for the fan base about some good news on the way. Meanwhile, it is alleged that Hathcock no longer wanted to do the deal through his entity, through his company. He says he's selling his company. Again, it's strange the timing of the allegations, given that he's putting out these bold tweets at the same time, trying to get himself out of the deal. Eddie Rojas, the CEO of the Gator Collective, this is a separate collective from Hathcock coming to the picture. Um, where they're basically saying, we'll fund this deal. That my message is communicated to Jaden Rashada that the second collective, the Gator Collective, will fund this deal because Hathcock uh, no longer wants his company or his NIL to be involved, even though he's you know, putting out these tweets. Uh, the lawyer for Gator Collective, Jennifer Grosso, is drafting the agreement, and she understood that Hathcock would be wiring money to the second collective to make sure that the payments could be made to Rashada. And this would include the $500,000 signing bonus. And so, again, this is all allegedly communicated to the Rashadas that Hathcock, even though he's not going to be dealing with this deal directly as far as his NIL and his entity, his business entity, he'll still be paying the money to the collective to make sure that this happens. November 10th, 2022, we have a screenshot from Gator Collective. And again, Gator Collective is not a defendant in this lawsuit. They were the party that signed the contract with Rashada. That contract itself is not an issue in this lawsuit, which is interesting. So Rojas says, let me finish the paperwork and get his flip tonight. Excited about this for all of us. And then the Miami factor comes in. And Rojas says, we're going to have to dodge the freaks in Miami. I hate Miami. This is going to be fun to watch. And of course, as Miami fans know, this has indeed been very fun to watch. Uh, November 10, 2022, Rashada flips and the contract goes into effect with Gator Collective. People up the, the contract details here, which Andy Staples tweeted out. You, you can see the payments that are being made here. Uh, just an uh, insane amount of money monthly, six figures. We're talking about a $13.85 million overall contract. Monthly payments of $250,000 for the period of January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2023, basically all last year. Monthly payments of $250,000. Then this year, 2024, monthly payments of $291,666.66. Again, it's just an insane amount of money. The next year, 
25, three uh, monthly payments of $375,000. And then of course, if he stayed for a senior year, we're talking about 195,000, 833.33 monthly payments. So huge numbers promised and agreed to by the contract uh, that he signed with the Gator Collective. So what happens after this? He's flipped December 4th, 2022. The signing bonus is coming due December 5th, 2022. Remember, this is the $500,000 signing bonus that we understood Hathcock was going to pay the booster. Hathcock allegedly confirmed that it would be coming through Castro Walker, who's the UF employee and basically in charge of NIL. And the agents reached out to Castro Walker, said, you're connecting with Hugh later today on that first payment, correct? And Castro Walker allegedly responded, yes, I spoke to him the other day. He was working something out with his account. December 5th comes. The signing bonus is never paid. December 6, 2022, after the signing bonus doesn't come through, the Gator Collective, again, this is the second NIL entity, which actually signed the contract with Rashada that we just read out, sends a letter terminating the deal. So now this big contract is out, out the door, and he hasn't gotten his signing bonus. Signing day is on December 21st, 2022. He still has not gotten any money. And as we all remember, there was that whole debacle where he didn't sign right away and the rumors were flying that it was because of exactly this issue not being paid the money that was promised but let's move back a little bit i got a little ahead of myself i apologize so december 6th contracts terminated december 7th 2022 castro walker this is the uf representative told rashida's agents that the gator guard collective now going back to the hathcock going back basically to the original deal this is the first nil collective that's run by hathcock himself that they would accept the assignment of that $13.85 million obligation. So basically the agreement that Hathcock was going to do originally that got taken over by Gator Collective would go back to Hathcock to, to pay. No one's been paid at this point anything, though. The $500,000 is still not paid. December 9, 2022, Hathcock pays $150,000. There's really the only money that changes hands here. But the $150,000 doesn't go to Rashada. It goes to John Ruiz, uh, the Miami supporter, based on... Apparently, language with the Ruiz had with Rashada on the separate deal that would have, I don't know if it would have required a penalty, if there was an upfront payment by Ruiz. It's not clarified, but whatever it was, the fear was that Ruiz would go after Rashada. So Hathcock took care of this allegedly by paying $150,000 to Ruiz, the only guy that got paid in this situation. December 21st, 2022. Okay, so now we're getting to signing day. Napier's freaking out. Rashada's not signing. Castro Walker, this is a UF person in charge of NIL. This was a former UF employee, UF employee at the time, uh, communicated that Coach Napier said that Hathcock is on a plane and he will wire one million to Rashada. He wants the paperwork and I'm sending if you are good. And that Napier would get it done and he has power as head coach. There was also allegedly pressure put on by Castro Walker, UF employee, to Rashada saying that Napier would walk away from everything if Rashada didn't sign. At this point, he's been assured that he's going to get a million dollars. He signs with UF. Money doesn't apparently come. In January 18th, 2023, about a month later, he withdraws from the whole thing. So that's the chronology. And it really paints sort of an ugly picture about the way the Gators approach this process. You're talking about the day that he's flipping, you're messing with the money. And then the day after you're supposed to pay a signing bonus, you cancel the contract unilaterally. And then something happens between the twenty first, the the day that the payments missed, and the date of signing that gets Rashada to sign. And Rashada obviously had second thoughts about the whole deal that played out publicly. That Rashada was having concerns, but something made him sign. And here they're alleging that it was promises communicated on behalf of Billy Napier. Again, this is just allegations. So, you know, my big picture thoughts on this, the, the optics look terrible. And this would potentially be a jury trial if it ever got to that point, which I doubt, but it would be a jury trial. So these kind of things are important. The optics, the emotional appeal. Also, the way this complaint was written, which, by the way, it was a very well-written complaint, in my opinion, was for public consumption, for public opinion, for the media. The person in charge of this lawsuit, the lead lawyer, is Rusty Harden. If you remember that name, he was the lawyer prosecuting, not prosecuting, but suing Deshaun Watson for the whole scandal with the massages in Houston. Rusty Harden was in the news all the time. He is a high profile guy that is in the media. So this complaint was really written for the media. And I think the timing of this looks bad. 
the, the tweets look bad. The fact that these people were tweeting, we're talking about rivals. The impression you get from reading the complaint, and quite frankly, what I know about the case from just external sources, is that it feels like you had egos of millionaires, multimillionaires hurt by what Ruiz was tweeting about the Gators and their egos got so inflated that they made a deal that they couldn't abide by in the heat of the moment. And then a young kid got caught holding the bag. I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm saying that's the impression you get reading these allegations and reading some of the stuff that's been public and remembering the tweet wars at the time. That was a real thing. It feels like a millionaire, multimillionaire ego war that ultimately damaged the kid because while Miami Fulfilled its NIL obligations, the Gators did not and uh, could not. So, you know, that to me is really the impression. We'll see what the Gators say in response. You know, if the Gators, it, one thing I, I gather from this is that there's language in that contract with the Gator Collective that allowed them to get out of it legally because the Gator Collective is not being sued for breach of contract. There's no allegations really about the contract itself as far as a breach of contract. That's not alleged here. There's no count for breach of contract. So, that tells me the Gators may be able to have gotten out of that smooth without any issue. And more of the claims are about what surrounded the whole thing. Again, the alleged fraud, the alleged inducement for Rashada to forego his $9.5 million deal with UM, which is disputed whether there was a deal, and also any other NIL opportunities that he would have. He, for, he had to forego those opportunities because – he thought he had a deal with the Gators, which they unilaterally terminated. And even if that's true, that they had the ability to terminate the contract, that doesn't look that great. You know, your money's due on the 5th, and you cancel the contract on the 6th without paying. Most people, at least viscerally, think when you sign a contract, you have an agreement. You can't just cancel it when it's time to pay. So it's going to be interesting to see how that contract plays into things. It's certainly how it plays into the broader narrative. Um, and then, to me, the timing of what happened between the contract being terminated December 6th and Rashada ultimately signing. What was spoken to Rashada during that time period? Because obviously he knew he wasn't going to get that original deal, or at least pursuant to that contract with the Gator Collective. And he was having a lot of second thoughts, but ultimately something reassured him to make him sign and try to fulfill his part of the agreement. You know, he didn't get hurt. He didn't get arrested. What change what changed between when he signed it and when they terminated it and what was told to him from the time the contract was terminated to when he signed? Those are things that just jump out to me. Again, very early. Um, this is just kind of off the cuff, but I, would, I did read through the complaint, and these are just some of the things that popped out to me. Overall, it looks terrible for the Florida Gators and the court of public opinion. I don't see any way the Gators come out of this looking good, which is why a very good chance that this may settle in the discovery phase. Again, just spitballing. But just seeing how bad this looks for the Gators, I don't see a narrative out of this. Every scenario, every narrative has them looking bad from what I've seen. We'll see what happens on the response, uh, and we will uh, we'll keep stay tuned to that. Let's talk about some people with an impeccable reputation. That is Caneswear and Caneswear.com. Florida Panthers, get ready for the Eastern Conference Finals. Get your Panther gear, Caneswear.com, or the store in Davie, right next to La Spada's Hoagies. You will not find a better collection of Miami sports gear, not just the Canes, but also Panthers, Heat, Marlins, Dolphins, you name it. Caneswear.com if you are out of state. Best in the business. Switching gears. We've talked a lot about collectives here. One collective that you don't hear about getting embroiled in these kind of controversies. Canes Connection. Uh, a, a collective which, again, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. Have you heard about any issues with payment from Canes Connection? I have not, and uh, I don't anticipate that you will. We have a great interview today with a high-profile five-star athlete that chose not to go to the University of Florida, chose to go to the University of Miami. That is Samson Okanlola, offensive lineman for the Canes, tackle, guard, you name it, former five-star, played a lot with the first team this spring, had a really, really good interview with him, super smart kid, very focused, really enjoyed that talk. So uh, stay tuned, and here comes Samson Okanlola. All right, Canes fans, very, very excited about this next guest here on the Canes Insight podcast in our connection with Canes Connection. Samson Okanlola, offensive lineman and Canes Connection athlete at the University of Miami. Samson, appreciate you joining us today. Excited to get you to know you a little bit. Obviously, we'll talk some football, but get to know you off the field a little bit. So thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? 
Yeah, I'm doing good. How are y'all doing? Doing great, man. Doing great. And, you know, obviously you were you last year had had your your injury process. So everyone is excited to see you out there this season back at it, fully healthy. Um, let's talk about your recruiting process a little bit. Obviously, one of the most highly rated guys, recruited guys in the country could have gone anywhere you wanted. Wind up down here in South Florida with Coach Cristobal, Coach Mirabal. Your recruiting process, talk about it a little bit. You stayed firm with Miami because, you you know, you committed early there and you, you stuck with it. So talk to us a little bit about that process. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely seen something going on over here. You know, it was a hard decision when I was at high school, but definitely was the best decision I made. I mean, overall, just looking at the coaches, looking at the family aspect, you know, talking to my parents, it was definitely a great decision to come down here. Now, it's funny, you know, like with a lot of kids, they talk about branding and they don't really do anything to brand. But you with the Pancake Honcho, that was a real brand. I, I was getting group chat messages like, hey, when's, when's Pancake Honcho committing? What's Pancake Honcho committing? So it actually caught on. So talk about that process, like developing that and making that a thing. Oh, yeah, most definitely. You know, I, I came up with an idea and I came up with a nickname. And nickname was Pancake Honcho. I'm like, you Google Pancake Honcho right now, only me pops up. So I, I definitely made it the brand of who I am, Pancake Honcho. Samson Oklahoma is Pancake Honcho. You know, just creating that brand, going on visits, you know, talking to a bunch of coaches, you know what I'm saying, and talking to my family. Just how, like, kind of business is, you know what I'm saying, learning more about the business part, like marketing. So taking Pancake photo shoots at schools, you know, free marketing right there. So. I definitely love, love that marketing scheme I made for myself. And, and now that we're on it, let's talk about Kane's connection because obviously they've been a, a big part of what you've done. You, I know you had a deal last year. I think it was with Sergio's locally, right, where, where they had the pancake card. Um, so talk about Kane's connection a little bit and how they've you know, helped you with that process and helped you in general since you've been, been down here in Miami. Oh, yeah. Kane's connected has been very great to me, you know, it's helped me with the marketing process, helping me figure a bunch of things out when it comes to business. So, you know, just talking to people who run it. So they're doing a great job. Now, it seems like you really, for someone who's you know, still so young, have a real appreciation and interest in kind of business and, and having a business type approach to football, to off the field, et cetera. Or, you know, talk to me about that mindset and where it comes from. Uh, it just comes from my, my father, my mother, you know, to become real business like people. You know, my, my father started his own business, you know, he's a mechanic, owns his own shop, you know. So just coming from that, looking at that, you know, I always want to create something for myself. I definitely thought about creating something myself. You know, I was a five star. I had all that. I had all this rankings high. So I was like, what can I gain off that? What can I have from that from like three to four, five, six, seven, eight years? Because you only become a five star once. So. You know, just trying to use that that boom I had. I always say boom because you always need boom to create something. So I had boom, so I created something, something for myself. And I hope it keeps going for me. Now that we're kind of on the topic of NIL and, and stuff like that, big news today. The trailer came out for the NCAA uh, football video game. Did you opt in? Are you going to be uh, in the game there as, as, a, as a player? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I definitely opted in. So we got we got to talk about it, man. I mean, I'm... I'm sure you're looking forward to playing. Did you play it growing up? I mean, uh, give me the background. I mean, I wasn't a, a crazy Madden player growing up. You know, I definitely dabbled a little bit in it, or I didn't really play NCAA. So I didn't play it growing up. But, like, now it definitely is, like, a achievement, you know, being in a game because that's every 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 sport athlete's dream is being in some type of game, having your name on there, having, like, your family members play you. You know right. what I'm saying? Now I got to ask you, my follow-up to that is – when you see your, your ratings on there, are you gonna max yourself out? Are you gonna are you gonna add some attributes? Or are you gonna just play how how they how they rate you? I mean, they're gonna rate me how they want to rate me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> they might because you know, I haven't really done too much over here yet. So definitely, I mean, I'm gonna get the game. I'm definitely gonna grind the game. You know, I'm, I'm gonna have my attributes higher. So I'm definitely gonna do all of that. There you go. Now, one thing you can do in the game that a lot of people can is you can play against your brother. You know, Samuel oh, yeah. Lola. He's in uh, he's in Colorado. So talk about just growing up with a brother that, you know, guys like you, there's not that many people that are as talented as you, but you have a brother who's another, you know, power four type player. So how was that growing up with someone like that? Oh, yeah, that was definitely great. You know, me and my brother went to the same high school. We're grinding next to each other. You know, when he wanted to work out, I had to work out. So it was like, 
even when I was younger, he was carrying me through the process, you know, carrying me through the recruiting process, carrying me through the process of learning how to be an athlete, how to be a proper athlete, what you needed to do, what time you needed to do it. So, I mean, he just set a high example for me, just like my other brothers. I had multiple brothers. So all my brothers, I have three other brothers who play football. So they also set an example of what to do and what not to do through their actions and how they did it. So I just learned so much from them where it just made me a better player. And, you know what I'm saying? You know, the saying is like the older – Older people are usually making all the like mistakes and this and that, and the youngest usually learn from them. So I definitely learned from all the mistakes they made and all the good things they made. If we're to line up a one on one right now, put on the pads, take it to the IPF, you against your brother, who's winning that one? If we line up ten reps, I'm winning every time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I I don't lose. You know, that's the type of confidence I gotta have. And let, and let me tell you something. If we brought your brother on you know what he would say. Yeah, he's winning every single rep, I'm sure. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you play this game, you cannot have confidence. So if you don't think you win every 10 rep, you ain't going to win one rep. Now, that athletic mindset, we talk to, to to players, and they obviously you're an offensive lineman now, but a lot of people play different sports, different positions growing up, you know, athletic journey. Talk about your athletic journey, starting from when you were young to where you are now. Yeah, my athletic journey, I mean, I started football – I don't even remember when I started football. When I started football, I remember the first day I tried to try out for the football team. They said I was overweight. So they said I was too I was too um, overweight for my age limit, so I couldn't play football. And so I found this this team that was like, you know, the unlimited teams where you got like other than Pop Warner, you know, you got teams where I play, you play unlimited. So I started off there, you know what I'm saying, getting to high school and I was a little three forty. Then I started wrestling. Wrestling really helped me, you know, losing weight, you know, getting more flexible getting stronger in the body and that's really when i started improving more in football now i have to ask you about wrestling i remember when i wrestled like you'd lose like eight pounds in a practice you know even if you weren't trying to lose weight so like what was yeah. that like how what was it the, what did you get from wrestling oh yeah i mean i definitely lost a ton of weight you know i used to wear full full sweatsuits in practice you know trying to burn the calories you know so like i definitely my my first year i never i didn't play officially but my second year i, I definitely made an indent you know taking all the way to the national level so I mean, just it just brings a certain type of mental fortitude you need to have. You know, you only have so small seconds to beat a dude. You know, what I'm saying the seconds where you're you're down by a couple points and you need to beat the dude by a pin. So it definitely just brings a whole lot of mental fortitude where you can bring up the football. So as you're wrestling another man one on one, you know what I'm saying? So it's way different from football. And you, you can physically like throw them around just in that. Same thing in football. So it's kinda like that's have a mental mental thing, mental process I brought into that, the same mental process I brought into football. Samson, you're talking about mental toughness. Obviously, last year, dealing with with your your injury, just talk about that process and kind of what it taught you. Uh, you know about being you know being a football player, and and obviously injuries are part of the game. But how, kind of how you handled it, and again the lessons that it that it taught you. I mean, just getting injured that early on, it, it brought me a lot of lessons. It brought me that. I mean. Time is limited, you know. You only got so long you're gonna play football and how long you're gonna play so healthy. So I definitely time is limited for me and I gotta I gotta achieve a lot right now. You know, I really wanna I really got a lot of ambitions, a lot of things I wanna achieve. So, you know, I gotta achieve them as as timely fashion I want and on God's time as well. So, you know, I'm definitely gonna face a lot of adversity and that's not gonna be the last time I face adversity. So I just play the process and my process is gonna be different many well. So and it's my process and at the end of my process they're going to be a good, they're going to be a good outcome. And I heard, you know, coach Cristobal and coach Mirabal were talking about just how you attacked it and that you didn't want to be injured. Some guys want to kind of stay in the training room and you were really trying to get out there, get back on the field. Um, saw you on the field in the spring, playing a lot with the first team, both right tackle uh, and guard, left guard, and, and really moving around. Talk about those two positions and, and how your mindset or your, your technique is different at those two spots. Yeah, so I guard. I mean, I guard. I'm, I'm definitely more aggressive. I'm definitely more because he's right in my face. You know, I'm, I'm definitely going to attack him more, but I'm also going to play the mind games where I don't attack him. But guard is just it brings a new element of more aggressiveness and more more things I can do when it comes to being aggressive. But I tackle. I definitely got to be more patient, depending on the dude, depending on how much speed he has, depending on how much power he has. So I can still be aggressive, but I can only throw it in spurs because I have to be more patient and aggressive. So it's definitely a mindset change of being patient, patient to aggressive. And, you know, having aggressive patience, you know what I'm saying? So I had to not flip a switch, more of a just understand what position I am and where am I playing in that.
Coach uh, Coach Maribel is notorious for loving wrestlers as far as offense alignment. There's the toughness element, which you talked about, and kind of what you'd go through mentally. But in terms of physically, is there anything from wrestling that you translate to the football field and how you play offensive line? Uh, yeah, most definitely. I mean, learning leverage, learning how to torque dudes, learning how to learning how to make dudes go where you want them to go. Because in wrestling, it's not as much of like uh, he's doing this give or take. You wanna you wanna sh- make him do something so you can do something off of that. So definitely like making dudes do what I want them to do off a certain reaction I might give them to make them like flip them over, throw them off the edge. You know what I'm saying? So wrestling taught me how to kind of just set things up for myself and how body movements, how people usually react, how certain movements, and how people might be on um, off balance so I can torque them a little better. So, Samson, we've talked to, you know, a bunch of your teammates on the offensive line. We just talked to Zach uh, a moment ago. Just talk about how that group, you think is meshing as a whole and what it's like to be around such a talented group, right? I mean, we understand that it's a really, really good group all around and just what it's like to be able to be pushed by those guys next to you every day. Oh yeah, most definitely. I mean, I mean, they're going to hold you kind of, they're definitely going to look at you when you, cause we're playing next, right next to each other. You know, you have to trust the man next to you. So they're going to hold you accountable. They're going to look at you every day and tell you what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right. You know, they're going to pick you up when you're doing right. They're going to, they're going to still pick you up when you're doing wrong. So they're definitely, we're a tight knitted group, you know, we're five workers of one. So we're all working together and striving for something together. Now we know you work hard on and off the field between the football, rehab for a while and, and school and all the things that you need to do. But when you do get some free time, you know, what do you like to do off the field? Off the field, I'm really just chilling. I'm only listening to music, playing the game a little bit, you know, kind of just filling my mind, but more just like, you know, talking with my parents, talking with my friends, you know, just hanging out with people, you know, take my mind a little bit off football for just a second a day, you know what I'm saying? To just kind of refresh and do more. I had a question. Uh, I don't think we've asked any of the other offensive linemen this, but we heard that Cam Ward. Everyone knows he took you guys to dinner, right? Uh, that that's that's what he said. What was uh what was that like? And did you go did you go crazy out there or what? Oh yeah, I mean, took us is all you can eat spot. So we definitely ate a lot. You know, we definitely filled our stomachs up. You know, it was definitely a great experience. I definitely appreciate Cam Ward. You know, he's a great person and great QB as well. Yeah, I mean, what, what what was that like? I mean, obviously you guys appreciated it, but for him to come in as the quarterback, you know, stepping in as one of the new leaders of the team here, obviously had you know wants to earn your guys' trust as his teammates. So what what is something like that signal? And just in general, how has Cam kind of stepped in and and been a leader already for the team? Uh, yeah, most definitely. I mean, I feel like Cam definitely understands what a quarterback is and what type of quarterback has to bring is a leadership. You know, you can't be a QB and not be a leader. So he definitely understood that from early on and understood that as he played quarterback all his life. So he came in and just started to become a leader from day one and showed it that he could be a leader. And we kind of just, you know, bought off of that, of that confidence that I'm a leader and I'm a QB here now. I have to lead. So definitely I'd love to see that from him. Now, look, you came from Massachusetts, so, in, you know, a city environment, but obviously much different weather, much different place overall. How's the adjustment been to Miami and how you're liking it down here? I mean, I love Miami. You know, Miami, it's a little hot down here, though, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I came, I just came back from Boston like two days ago. So, like, coming down here, I'm definitely sweating. I only, I only walked five steps. I'm still sweating, you know what I'm saying? So, definitely the heat down here is different, you know what I'm saying? When I come to, like, social life, you know, Miami's Miami. You know, you got you to stay focused, but. I mean, other than that, you know, Miami's a great, great place to be. It was the weather was was perfect up until like two weeks ago, man. It's been getting really steamy the last the last couple of weeks here. Oh, yeah, I mean, we, we got workouts next week, so Oof, not those won't be fun. Now running outside, we we definitely gonna be sweating crazy. Yeah. So, so last question before we let you go. I know you're a goal oriented person. Anybody that's read anything about you knows, you, like you, we talked about, business oriented. You you have high ambitions, high goals for yourself. Uh, what are some of your personal goals this year, and some of your team goals? Um, I'm, I'm more just going to talk about my team goals. You know, I kind of like to keep my personal goals good personal, but I mean, because everyone knows, you know, I, you know, I do have dreams to be somewhere in life. So, but like our team goals, you know, we're, we're trying to win. We're trying to win, and that's that's the goal. We're trying to win at a dominant level and a high level, and we're trying to stay together as a team and hold everyone accountable. So, like, I mean, that team goal right there is a win and win at a high level. So, music to Kane's fans' ears, right there, Samson. 
great talking to you today. Great to get to know you a little bit. Best of luck this season. Like I said, Canes fans, really excited to see you out there. Thank you once again for joining us. Yes, sir. Have a good one. It's an insight to the games And you know we ain't playing no games Joaquin said dominate, so that's what we do Home of the legends and 7th floor crew Down in Miami where hurricanes brew You here for the rumors, we bring you the news Cause it's all about the you And nobody do it like Kane's in sight 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 Cause Kane's in sight